These are different segments, a book that is already written. And this can be understood if we go to that region. So there are many yogis, masters who have gone to that region and they have been able to take their own followers with them. An initiation by a teacher of that magnitude who can take you to a universal mind where you can see everything that ever happened, where you can see the time being created and flowing out. That initiation is supposed to be great. It is now dealing with consciousness at different levels. There are many psychics who use psychic power arising from the chakra. Many psychics who use power of what they call out of body experience. Out of body experience is nothing so great. When I came in the 60s, that was 30 years ago. In this country, I used to meet a lot of people. There used to be a hippie movement going on and new, new groups coming up, new cults were coming up, especially in California. And then they travel to East Coast and reached right into the, uh, the sacred precincts of Harvard and so on. So they came and they talked of out of body experiences. That I am attached to a, with a silver cord and I can experience walking away. And I was so fascinated because I said, why do you need a silver cord? I always ask one question. Why do you need a silver cord? Are you so afraid? Actually, they were afraid. It took me some time to convince them that they needed the silver cord out of their fear. They were afraid if the silver cord snapped, they will be dead. It showed they took the physical body to be more real than the body that walked away. That they could not afford to lose this one. They had to be tied to the physical from the astral. So, if there is a danger, if the silver cord became very thin, they could jump back and go back into the real one and come up and tell, thank God. Of course, some made story, and I used to attend these seminars, spiritualist seminars and spiritual frontier fellowship meetings where special sessions were held with people having out of body experiences. And new kind of humor started when we heard that somebody went and got the silver cord all mangled and twangled in a revolving door. Because when they started silver cord, there were no revolving doors. One had a real hard time, a, a lady who wanted to look up if the laundry was done and got a silver cord mixed up in the laundromat. <laughs> lot of new sense of humor came, but, but the point is, why do we need to, to be attached to the physical body? If we are having a higher spiritual experience, how can we be attached to this body with a visible cord, with a cord of which we are aware, and makes this body more real than that? Obviously, they were not talking of a higher spiritual experience. They were talking of something which is elementary. We all do it every day. If you sitting here think you are in that room, you already traveled there out of body. There is nothing more to this. None of those who went with the silver cord did anything more than that. I challenge you. Why are we making such a fuss of it? You want to create a cult out of it? You can. The truth is, the astral body is nothing more than the sense perceptions of the human physical body in total wakefulness. The sense perceptions being able to move away and function independently from the physical body. That's all that there is. The astral body is not a separate body from this one. The astral body are the very sense perceptions, the very fact that you can see. Who can see? Not the physical body. If the physical body could see, a dead body would also see. When you say this is a living body, therefore he can see, then life, what is life? Life is the ability to be able to use the physical eyes of a physical body to see. Seeing is not physical eyes. If seeing were physical eyes, nobody could imagine and see something, nor could you ever dream and see anything. How can you see in a dream? How can you see by imagination? How can you see what is happening home? How can you see what is happening on the road, sitting right here? If seeing was a physical phenomenon connected with physical eyes, 
How could any of this happen? The truth is, seeing is an astral phenomenon. The truth is, seeing is a sensory phenomenon. And when we see, we are using a sensory apparatus called seeing. Once we see and we associate that seeing with these eyes, we start saying, oh, we are seeing because of these eyes. If you practice a very strange art, which many of these yogis and masters practice, called dying while living. Ever heard of dying while living? That means to be dead in the physical body and still alive in your consciousness, if you ever practice that, which means you can use your power to see, power to touch, power to taste, power to smell, without remembering where your physical body is. If you can do that, that's an astral experience. You will notice that the power to see that each one of us has is far more than what we have ever seen through the physical body. What does it mean? We can see a lot more. These eyes are not helping us to see. These eyes are restricting how much we can see. Same thing with the senses in the body. All these senses in the body restrict our ability to experience. And when you can experience without the physical body, we call it an astral experience. The truth is, imagination is nothing more than the exercise of the physical body, of the astral body. If a person, if I were to say, will you, while keeping your body there, come imaginatively and shake my hand and go back and sit on your chair? Can you do it? How many of you can do it? Just keep sitting there and imaginatively, just imagine that you are walking along this aisle, come, touch my hand and go back and sit down. Has anybody done it now? Those who have done it, please raise your hand. Boy, so many of you just had an astral experience. No different from those which were propounded by this so-called silver cord theory. No different at all. But why did this look so unreal? It looks unreal because you used a very small part of your attention in coming to me and bulk of the attention, the 95%, 99% in the body on the chairs there. Supposing you had put more attention on coming here and less attention on staying with the body. Supposing you are less conscious of the body and more conscious of this trip to this podium, to this rostrum, you would have felt that the coming here was more real and an imaginary being was still sitting there. Do you know this only difference is the quantum of attention you put into it? That consciousness, where you put your consciousness, if you are totally oblivious of your body and walked imaginatively here, you would have a total astral experience. That's all there is to it. But why we are so heavily grounded in the physical body is because we have grown with the assumption this and the time frame is real. And everything we are trying to find out is within the parameters of a real physical world, a real physical body, and the rest is imaginary, or rest is some kind of a trip that we have to make to see who we really are. It doesn't work like that. The sensory systems which constitute the astral body have been used by the masters for centuries. And when they initiate us, they tell us how to put more attention into the senses and less attention into the body to make that experience absolutely real. Any one of you can do it. It's no big deal to be able to concentrate your attention so much at consciousness itself, not at any particular point. If you are able to concentrate your attention, concentrate means put more and more of that attention, diverting it from the rest of the activities that are going on, diverting it from the rest of your body, if you can put more and more of your attention towards wherever you believe you are operating from in the third eye behind the eye, you will after a while be unaware of the body and will be aware of yourself and can walk out and your body is still there and you can see it. And you don't need a silver cord for that. You can walk out at will and come back into the body at will and you will discover that the whole game is a consciousness operating through concentration of attention that is creating a reality here or there. Masters who gave this art were great because they were able to show the total illusion of this creation. That this creation was illusion. That it was created from the sensory to the physical, not vice versa. That imagination was more real than physical experience. They were able to prove it. Now, we were stuck with the philosophy and never had the experience. But those disciples who were initiated, that means they practiced that under the inspiration of that master, they were able to get that experience. And hence we call them initiated disciples. Those who could go beyond to universal mind where senses were no longer needed, they are called the initiates of the teachers of the Brahma region, the creative region. 
अल्टीमेट क्रिएटर फॉर अस इन दिजिकल वर्ल्ड क्रिएटर सिट इन दल्टीमेट यूनिवर्सल माइंड बिकॉज वी हैव नो वे टू नो वट इट वुड बी लाइक वेर इज नो टाइम वॉट इट वुड बी लाइक वेर इज नो स्पेस इट इज पॉसिबल फॉर अस to imagine a situation in which we can be with no space and no time that is why in our present frame the highest level we can contemplate think of go with all our understanding is the universal mind where every mind is one and we find that all the history is written down and we are all participating in a common destiny and pulling out from that common space and common time but that is not the that is not what the spiritual teachers teach us they tell us that these yogis these masters who reach the universal mind they had great experience and great knowledge they could tell you all about the nature of past lives future life reincarnation they could tell you how to trace back your own lives they could regress you to see any of your own lives you could go 1000 2000 10000 years and see your own previous lives through that meditation process they were great in their own work but they could not teach something very basic they could not teach the disciple how to love they could not even teach the disciple what is love they could not teach the disciple what it is to have an intuitive knowledge that comes from no reasoning at all they could not teach that they could not teach what real beauty means what real joy means what bliss means they could teach all the information about universal universality of creation and the mind and the cosmos and the world they could take you to the highest level possible for a human mind to know but they could not teach you something that come from beyond that they could not teach how the soul of a human being which crying out for company in its loneliness is not made up of the stuff that thought for me up they could not teach that thinking is not a process that the human soul is using that thinking by a mind is something different than love and beauty and joy of the spirit of the soul they could not teach it was left to masters beyond the brahm beyond creation beyond creator we call them beyond create creator masters beyond creator who could draw our attention to the fact that the human soul is way above this it is not confined to time and space it is not confined to cause and effect it is not confined to karma there is no law of karma except made by the mind there is no law of reincarnation except made by the mind there is no coming and going except with the mind there are no millions of lives going on except in the mind there is no huge cosmos existing and created by god except in the mind that all this knowledge we had of what creation is was all created by the mind and did not exist in the soul did not exist in truth which is beyond time and space these teachers these masters who came from that region they could not teach you in mental images or in mental language or in physical language or in spoken language the only way they could teach us through initiation was to make us like themselves to practices which they had taken upon themselves when they were initiated by their masters that initiation is totally different from any kind of teaching an initiation that can take us beyond all comprehension an initiation that transforms us not because of what we have learned but because of what is beyond learning cannot be called an ordinary initiation if this kind of a transformation can take place it may be a true beginning and then there are some rare masters extremely rare i have traveled a lot around the world and i have been in search of masters all the time if i were as keen to get initiated as i was keen to see masters i would beat the record of the much initiated lady who was friend of mine i would be initiated over and over again because i met masters over and over I met every master anybody could point out, ran the whole gamut of every level of master, and I tell you, a master who can even share with you information that is belonging to the spirit and goes way above the mind is extremely rare experience. And then, out of these rare species, there is one rarest of rare, called the perfect living master. perfect living master is a very rare phenomenon in this creation so what does it mean a perfect living master means a living being a living human being because in this world there is nothing higher than that there is nothing higher than us because we are perfect wakeful human beings amongst us one who has a consciousness that transcends all these levels 
and can reach the level of the spirit at the same time while that person is human. Such a person is called the perfect living master. A human being while alive has through his consciousness experienced the totality of the spirit beyond mind. Very rare experience. And to be able to have the experience of such a master and to be in the company of such a master is the greatest thing that can happen. When we get initiated by such a master, what happens? What is the beginning? What, is the, what do we start? When we talk of initiation by a perfect living master, we are now talking of a different ball game altogether. We are now talking of starting a life which is linked with an, re, with an area of experience beyond mind, an area of experience beyond reincarnation, an area of experience beyond karma, an area of experience beyond all the knowledge that we have about time. To be able to have this kind of a beginning is a true beginning of a spiritual journey. Once great master was asked, my own teacher, master, people have great journeys, they fly in the sky and they do these various things uh, when they come to you and they suddenly sometimes when you are initiating them, they shiver and they leave their body and they explain beautiful sights they have seen, great bursts of stars and lights and sounds and great Shabbat they hear, great uh, beautiful melodies they hear. Isn't that wonderful? He said, well, maybe it's wonderful, but my teaching doesn't start except from beyond the mind. My teaching starts from beyond these experiences. My teaching starts from the point when we realize we are soul and our journey is from the soul to totality, which is the creator. My teaching is not confined to any of these experiences. If somebody wants to start on a real spiritual journey, must find the self, the true self. If a person finds the true self and then becomes the total self, that is my spiritual journey. The true self is not the mind. The true self is not all this experience. You can stack up all this beautiful experience. You don't know who you are. You're still witnessing through glasses. You're still looking at things and getting excited about a nice experience. Who is the experiencer? It's not known. The self as the experiencer is known only above the mind. And then we understand things like God is love, love is God. Why do we say all this all the time? Just to try to reduce the level of hatred in the world? Just to reduce violence? Just to promote cults and religions? Or do we really know what we are talking about? Only a perfect living master can demonstrate that love, which is the experience of identifying with others and not finding a difference. That experience of identification when you cannot say who is who and you don't have to say I love you because you becomes I. That rare experience when the I is forgotten and the you takes over, that experience is not known except in true love at that point where the separation created by the mind disappears. True love, the experience of true love is a truly spiritual experience. And the experience of true love is the spiritual journey that perfect living masters take us on. The perfect living master takes us on a true experience of true love. And a true initiation is when they break our line of reincarnation, mental gymnastics, going round and round in circles, never getting off these horses in this carousel going on, to take us to a point where the journey towards totality in love begins. That's a real new beginning. These human beings, they come and sit with us like ordinary human beings. They don't have to show any tricks. Because they are perfect living masters, they use love as their only method. They don't have to use any tricks to, to, to show that we are the masters. They never say we are masters. I have not heard from any perfect living master saying, I am the master. I hear them being described as masters by others. They give their simple message. They don't give a message for a particular group. They don't found any religions. They give a simple message of the beauty of love and oneness, the beauty of totality. And they draw us by that message. And when they initiate us, they totally turn the course of our life. Not life in this, in this particular physical body. Life in the whole of creation. We do not know how long we have been here. We have no knowledge. We do not know how long this mind has been our mind in how many forms. We have no knowledge. Of course, we can get that knowledge when we go to higher regions of the astral and causal levels. But this history of our mind, which we take as our own history, is only broken when we rise above it and find we are the soul. 
and have no history at this level. This is just an illusion and an experience. The great perfect living masters who initiate us, they turn the entire direction of our journey from being going from going round and round in this experience to getting out of this experience and getting into reality. And they do not make us better people. They don't come to improve our lot. They don't come to improve our status. They don't come to improve our face. They don't come to improve uh, our spiritual stature. They come to make us like themselves. There is, a, there is a philosopher's stone. They say if the philosopher's stone touches iron, it becomes gold. But they say perfect living masters are different than the philosopher's stone. A philosopher's stone turns iron into gold. But a perfect living master touches iron and makes it into the philosopher's stone, not into gold. They make the disciple like themselves. Whatever joy and happiness they are getting out of this awareness and that realization of their totality, they make us exactly like them. This transformation, this change is of immense importance to us. In practical terms, if we are lucky in this life to run into a perfect living master, because there is no way to know who is a perfect living master. There are too many masters around. As I said, there are more masters than disciples. If we run into a perfect living master and are affected by that master and the master decides to initiate us, which means says, I accept you and you start a new life with initiation, from that point onwards, we are free from the cycle of karma. From that point onwards, we are not subject to that same cycle cause and effect. From that point onwards, our journey starts in a totally different direction. But since we have adopted this physical body and we have adopted a course of destiny based upon this physical body. They do not interfere and they allow this destiny to run its course. But from that moment onwards, we are no longer accountable to the principles of time and destiny, to the principles of cause and effect, which sometimes in our Indian versions we call kal or time, the bigger time. There is no accountability of the human soul to time and destiny if one is once initiated by a perfect living master. It is a true initiation. It is an initiation that cuts you from the previous journey and puts you on a new track altogether. The initiation makes so much difference in our life. For once we know somebody is responsible. Perfect living masters who initiate us assume full responsibility for our spiritual journey. They do not say, well this is our teaching. We given it to you, not for you to practice or not to practice. They do not say, this is knowledge we acquired and we are sharing with you. Now it is your luck whether you get any benefit or not. Many teachers will do that, but not a perfect living master. A perfect living master who gives us true initiation takes 100 percent full responsibility for the completion of our spiritual journey. And that journey is not in isolation. It is not that, okay, here is the recipe. Now you cook yourself your own meal. They join us in cooking together. They say we are going to be companions forever. That is a great experience. The greatest experience is that in the company of a perfect living master, whether it is physical external company or it is the internal company in meditation where you can get the radiant form of the same master present all the time, 24 hours. In either of these two, that presence takes away your loneliness forever. I do not know any other way which can take human loneliness away so successfully as the companionship of a perfect living master. I have heard people trying their best to remove loneliness and to remove their sense of isolation by trying to develop relationships all over. They have spiritual relationships, they have physical relationships, they have relationships cast by blood and by marriage and by friendship and so many relationships. And it is only a matter of time. It takes a little time to discover that nobody exists in our experience. Nobody exists in our experience who can give us the feeling that we are identical. There is always a feeling that we are not fully understood. He or she does not fully understand. There is some point which is so deep and nobody has touched us except the perfect living master. The perfect living master seems to touch that part of us which we ourselves do not know is the innermost part of our own soul. That identification with the innermost part, that love where we feel we have now found somebody who is with us right in the innermost self does not come with anybody except the perfect living master. 
and it is that relationship which takes us out of a sense of loneliness. Therefore, there are many advantages. A perfect living master who initiates us, takes full responsibility and does not say, I'll desert you at any time, can never desert, has never deserted. We may desert. We may desert. The perfect living master still does not desert. It's a unique experience. True initiation is only an initiation by such a being, such a perfect living master. Such a perfect living master is a human being in a physical body, but his consciousness is different. How do you recognize such a perfect living master? Obviously, if such a person, a human being comes up whose consciousness is at that level, that person has come to share something great. That person has so much wealth, such big spiritual wealth, such immense knowledge, such immense experience, such immense overflowing love to share. That person has not come to take anything from us. So be sure absolutely I want to say categorically, if somebody says, I will give you initiation, send me a check for $20, you are not getting a perfect living master. If anybody says, I am going to pray for you and help you in heaven, you send me a check, there is no perfect living master. I do not know any perfect living masters who have ever come and used us for their own survival. Perfect living masters come to give, not to take. They are always givers, they never take us. So it does not take too long. When you come across somebody who is looking at your wallet more than your eyes, you should be sure you are not in the right company. But a perfect living master is not only a giver, he could be a rich guy who instead of running for the presidential race, may run for the spiritual race. Say, I am a perfect living master, I do not need your money, I will give you the checks. Then you have to be sure that the message he is giving is not drawing you to something outside. Here we are talking of a world which is creating an illusion of reality and we are being messed up by this world by taking this physical to be real, we are taking this physical relations to, to be real, this physical attachments to be real and messing up our life and making it so miserable and painful and somebody comes up and says, no, connect there, connect here, outside again and again, how could that be a perfect living master? A perfect living master always, always underlined, double underlined, always shows the truth to you in your own self not outside. If somebody is trying to teach you something existing outside, forget it. Don't waste your time. Perfect living master will tell you the beauty of your own self, the beauty of the reality is within your own self. Go and find it. If you still don't find such a perfect living master, remember the perfect living master is inside you, not outside. If outside is all illusion, how could a perfect living master be outside? The truth is the perfect living master is our own highest total form. The real master is inside us at all times. We do not look inside. We do not know how to look inside. We close our eyes, it is so dark. We do not want to look inside. We want to look outside. We want to travel to workshops, seminars, lectures, anything except going inside. We are willing to do anything in the light of these bulbs or the sunlight, but not in the darkness of our closed eyes in meditation. If the perfect living master is in fact our own higher self, our own total consciousness within our own self and we do not turn that way, what can the total consciousness of the self do except to spring out and be part of an experience outside? So we can see that person as some being other than our own self who pushes you back and says, go inside and we go inside and find that as our own self. That is the true nature of the perfect living master. The perfect living master is not perfect in his physical form. The perfect living master is perfect in the physical form to push us back to our own total realization within our own self. The truth is not outside. The truth is inside. We do not see it there. We do not know how to see it there. So we go to a teacher, to somebody outside, a friend, somebody who looks, he has some key and he says, go in, go in, I will tell you how, go in. He never knew, I will tell you how. And we go in and find that what we were looking outside was actually inside. That is the nature of a perfect living master. A perfect living master is not made of flesh and bones. A perfect living master is made of the same stuff consciousness is made of. And what is that stuff? When we say he is conscious, he is unconscious, he is aware, he is alive. What is this stuff called alive? What is the living stuff, this vital force? What is the stuff that makes us alive? What is the stuff that makes us conscious and aware? What is the stuff that makes a body which is dead walk up and walk and see? and hear and touch and taste and smell. What is the stuff, the substance of consciousness? The substance of this consciousness 
has never been adequately described in any language, in any words. It's very difficult to describe it. For want of any other words, every discipline in the world, every religion in the world use the same metaphorical language to describe that which is indescribable. The basic substance of life, the basic substance of consciousness, and for want of any other word, what do they call it? The word. Can you imagine? There was nothing else to call it. In the beginning was the word. All things were made by that word. When you talk of a word like that, I am not only referring to what John said in his gospel, I am referring to what the Vedas said much before John. That in the beginning was the nard, the sound. In the beginning was that unstruck music. In the beginning was that which could be heard but not described. Take any religion of the world, take any spiritual discipline of the world, for want of any other words, they describe the creator of consciousness itself to be something that is audible, can be heard, but not described. What do you call that? Well, give it any name, hardly matters, so long as you can call it music, celestial music, Shabbat, Naam, word, Holy Ghost, whatever you like to call it. Call it by any title or designation, you understand it is the melody and resonance of the self that becomes alive. Melody and resonance of consciousness that makes us alive and subject to experience of any level, whether physical, astral, causal, total, any experience, the fact that we can be conscious to have any experience, that consciousness, the substance, is made of the stuff which we call the word. And would I be then wrong to say that a perfect living master's real form is the word, not the human form? The human form is so temporary. How could a power that is beyond time be confined to a form that is temporary. The perfect living master's real form has always been, will always be the word. The word which has no beginning, no middle, no end. It was not created. It created. It created the creator. It created God. It made God known. That power, that consciousness, the totality of consciousness, which makes all this possible, is the real form of a perfect living master. Initiation by that form is a rerouting of our entire spiritual destiny and our spiritual life. When we see a human being, an ordinary human being who was born and dies, dies mostly at our hands. We kill these people mostly because we don't like them. These ordinary human beings who grow up like this and share with us something which is inside us, it's the greatest of experiences. To be initiated by such a being, to discover our own self is the greatest experience I have known or ever heard of from anybody. Therefore, true initiation by a perfect living master continues to be the greatest human experiences that has ever taken place in history or is likely to take place in the future. If anybody knows any experience greater than that, I would be very happy to know it. Please share with me. I have not been able to find in my life, I spent time with so many masters, so many disciplines, that true initiation, that means rerouting of our destiny by a perfect living master who is an ordinary human being, who is sharing his love and spiritual awareness in order to take us back to our own true self. To be initiated by such a one is nothing like it. I hope many of you sitting here, being seekers of long standing, I am not joking, have some eye to see. I mean, some of you know I have an eye, x-ray eye to see sometimes. And I'm not joking when I say that as I scan you here now, I see most of you, seekers of great standing, even in terms of time. That means your seeking has not come up suddenly now. It has been built over lifetimes. It cannot have come suddenly in the manner in which it is expressing itself today. This seeking is what draws you to a perfect living man. If somebody were to say, how can I find a perfect living master? My answer always has been, seek in your own heart. Don't open your mouth. Don't ask anybody. Seek in your own heart and you will find, definitely. So you who are seekers, I hope many of you, indeed most of you, will find true initiation from a perfect living master. And I, in anticipation of that great experience for you, congratulate you and wish you well. Yes. Is there a difference between the astral form of the master and the real form? Yeah. Real form means physical form? 
The real form is formless. Real form is formless. There is no form. The moment we introduce form, it is unreal. The master is formless. The master is the basis of consciousness. The moment there is form, we are limiting the master. So the real form of the master is totally formless. But at different levels of consciousness, we have different forms. In the physical level, the master is like us, looks like us, talks like us, walks like us, eats, drinks like us, dies like us. But in the astral form, it is full of beauty and light shining and we call it the radiant form. In the causal form, the same master whom we have known here in the physical form is a companionship of identification where we don't see a difference. We go together in the same form. In the spiritual form, it is the experience of love. So, as we go into higher and higher regions, in the total form, there is no form at all. Yes? I would like to ask if, um, if I and the creator and the author, as you talked about the book, are one. They are one. The, uh, the fact we sometimes feel they are not one is illusion. The truth is the only one. The truth is only one actually exists. The reality is only one being. Not to be. But when you say one, some people may get away with the idea there is one and we are not amongst them. Sometimes uh, people used to talk about oneness. People used to talk about oneness and I had to, I, I remember a friend of mine, Jack Bemmel, used to talk about oneness. And I said, oneness is misleading here. You should talk of allness. That oneness and allness are the same. There is nothing outside of it. Yes. That poses a little bit of a problem for the issue of free will going back about a half an hour ago. Um, mm. If it's fullness and oneness and, and that includes us all, then, and it's the creator who is the only one with free will, that's us. That's true. Us? A me or self? You us, use three words. Us, us as all, right. <laughs> Here we go. We're and it's not one. Us as all is not one. Us as one and all. Then yes. Us as us and one, no. Us separates us. Us is a mental experience. Us means we are many. The many is an illusion. And once we are in that illusion, the many persist. So we have different free wills. Now let me give you a little example. Supposing you go to sleep and have a dream. In the dream you meet 20 people. You sit around the table and discuss. How is this dream coming into being? Are we all dreaming or only one is dreaming? What's the true answer? The true answer is only one is dreaming. But on the table, they all say, no, how can I come in if you are dreaming? Who is dreaming? They can argue forever. Now, you will notice if you had such a dream, and we all have had dreams, you will notice that in the dream, there is a, an experiencer called self, who is seeing the others and cannot see himself. The experiencer cannot see himself, can feel himself, can feel he is there with the others. The others can be seen. The one that cannot be seen is the dreamer. The one that can be seen and look like the dreamers are the dream. Why not uh, juxtapose that position to this physical level? That the one that cannot be seen is a dreamer, but has the experience of being the self, the one that can watch others. Now, in this whole audience, if you look at it, you will see. There is nobody who can get up and say, no, I am experiencing two selves. Nobody has ever experienced. Nobody has experienced more than one self. And that self is the reality. The rest is part of the creation, part of the dream, part of the illusion. The fact we see so many who look like us, seem to have the same self we have, does not make so many selves. But for the purpose of this creation, there are so many selves. So us is a great illusion. The self is the truth. That is why nobody, none of these mystics ever said, let us find out who we are. They always said, let us realize the self. Self-realization and not realization of ourselves has always been, because self has always been one. I do not know any occasion, any situation in which any conscious being can experience more than one self. That's one interesting point to keep in mind that the self has never been more than one. Second interesting point is, that the fact you think you are that self does not alter if your whole body changes. Supposing you feel this is myself and I am in this body and I am watching so many others. Suddenly your body changes and becomes the body of a cloud. 
you will never say this is another self that has come. The same self will say, if memory is still intact, I have become a cloud. Just like when a person goes to sleep, and I give this example frequently, if in a dream you experience that you are a bird, and a bird that flies out of a window, you feel you flap your wings and fly out of a window and wake up, and you tell your relatives, your friends, what an interesting dream I had. I felt I was a bird. I flew out of a window. Your friends have every right to question. You were not a bird. You saw a bird flying out of a window. And you are positive. You never saw any bird flying out of a window. You flew out of a window. Bird has feathers, wings, have no resemblance to your body. And yet you are absolutely sure, 100% sure, it was you, the same self that flew. In fact, your entire body change in the dream did not change the persistence of the same self. Now, this is, I am taking the dream sequence because it is more easy to understand. We all dream. Let's take it upwards into higher regions. <laughs> you go and become enlightened, full of light, and you become the sun in a higher stage. It's still the same sun. And that persistence of the self never changes. You become ultimately the totality. There is nothing else existing. It's still the same self. The self never changes. Its experience changes. The experiencer never changes. That's the reality. When you say what is real and what is unreal, the good definition that these mystics give is what changes cannot be real. What never changes must be real. Now you look at what never changes. All the experience changes, but the experiencer who is watching the experience never changes. Therefore, there is consciousness. Thank you very much.